1905, Albert Einstein published his famous equation equals mc squared, defining for the first time in human history the fundamental relationship between mass and energy. Simultaneous work by Francis Austin in measuring the difference in mass between four hydrogen atoms and a helium nucleus led to a puzzling question. What was happening to the mass seemingly accreted by nuclear fusion? One letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt later, and U.S. fusion research was born. Early investigations in the field of fusion found that the first feasible candidate for nuclear energy was actually nuclear fission. These efforts would soon come to fruition at the climax of the Second World War, with the two atomic bombs dropped on Japan. While Russian and British physicists were busy replicating the fission experiments that allowed the U.S. to develop their first nuclear weapons, the United States was working on an actually even more powerful weapon, a fusion device. Fusion devices, however, could not be triggered using typical explosive triggers. The extremely high energies could only be triggered using fission devices to actually power the fusion stage of the bombs. Therein lies the problem in small-scale fusion. There are two affordable ways to accomplish nuclear fusion. The first involves the tremendous energies found only in the cores of fission devices or nearby stars. The second is magnetic or inertial acceleration of particles to the speeds necessary for fusion. So how does fusion work? The concept itself is fairly straightforward. Two high-energy nuclei of different atoms collide, and by overcoming the nuclear force, the two nuclei combine, releasing massive amounts of energy. If their product has lower binding energy than the reactants, then the energy in the system has a net increase. This energy can then be captured to do useful work such as producing electricity. Fusion is occurring constantly all around us. Fusion occurs not only in the, our sun, but in the upper atmosphere. However, not all particles are equal as some can fuse more readily than others. In today's fusion reactors, the fuels of choice are deuterium and tritium. Their energy of fusion is so low that the extreme gravitational forces found only in the cores of large stars are not necessary to initiate fusion. With a big enough reactor, the fusion can be self-sustaining. This is because excess heat can be used to boil water, generate steam, which turns a turbine. Now, the particles mentioned in today's nuclear reactions, deuterium and tritium, are hydrogen atoms with differing amounts of neutrons. Earlier, we mentioned how virtually any atoms that fuse together create energy. But why do nuclear reactors today rely on only deuterium and tritium? The answer is because they are the two atoms that are the simplest to use and create. Generally, the atom that is chosen is based on its binding energy, or the amount of energy it takes to add an electron to the outer shell of the atom. Deuterium and tritium both have low binding energies and are also fairly abundant. According to the Encyclopedic Dictionary of Astrophysics, the following table shows the reaction types, reactivity, and power density. The reactivity is the reactivity rel relative to the deuterium-tritium reaction, where a higher number means less reactivity. As seen, the deuterium-tritium reaction clearly is more reactive and has a greater power density than the other reactions. Unfortunately, there are numerous issues keeping nuclear fusion from being a viable energy source. Most notably, nuclei are comprised of protons and neutrons, and the repulsion force between protons is difficult to overcome in order to create a bigger nucleus. To overcome this, researchers must accelerate particles to relativistic speeds, essentially the speed of light. However, this means that emitted particles from reactors are shot out at re relativistic speeds, potentially damaging the reactor. Additionally, for a reactor to be more efficient, the reaction must be hotter. However, a hotter reaction is more difficult to contain and to start. Yet another problem is that the research for nuclear fusion is costly, as all the atoms that are used as fuel, the containment hardware, and the amount of space needed to accelerate particles to the speed of light is expensive. Since no reactor thus far has provided a sustained fusion reaction, Lawmakers feel that fusion research is a waste of governmental resources. However, nuclear fusion has its perks. If we can make the technology work, nuclear fusion is the second most energy producing process known to mankind, second only to antimatter reactors, which are purely theoretical at the moment. In addition, nuclear fission creates harmful radioactive waste that is dangerous to the environment. However, nuclear fusion primarily produces helium as waste which is an element that is increasingly scarce as its inert nature keeps it from being bound in mineral deposits. Finally, deuterium and tritium is mainly produced from seawater, 
The process separates salt from seawater and only a small percentage of the filtered water can be used to produce deuterium and tritium, meaning that the rest can be used as drinking water around the world. Although the problem with nuclear fusion is proving difficult for humanity to solve, the future of the technology does look promising. The Large, large Hadron Collider, Joint European Taurus, and the National Ignition Facility all constantly improving the technology and with a new International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor Project scheduled to complete production in 2020 and theoretically produce 10 times the input power in as early as 2030 to as late as 2050. The future does in fact look bright.